Africa, a continent of promise and perseverance. One which has in the realm of international criminal justice had its fair share of successes and setbacks. Often the African story has been of leaders who refused to be held to account for their crimes and citizens bearing the deep scars of that impunity. But even so, there have been many efforts to put right all of the wrongs perpetrated against Africans, accountability mechanisms that put justice back on course. These have included ad hoc international criminal tribunals, hybrid courts, international crimes divisions, more traditional systems such as the Gashasha Court and of course the International Criminal Court in The Hague. The way the court is perceived is extremely important. We need uh, the court uh, has time, is being criticized for instance of uh, uh, applying selective justice of targeting uh, a region, uh, a particular region, well, this type of uh, criticism uh, may affect the legitimacy of the court. We need to address it. Much as this is true, the International Criminal Court's credibility on the continent has suffered in recent times, owing to the perception created that it has a bias against Africa. If this court had been created in the 70s, probably this court would have started in Latin America. Argentina, Chile, El Salvador, Guatemala, all these countries were going into very difficult situ uh, circumstances at the time. And if this court had been established in the early 90s, and not at the end of the 90s, it would have started in Europe. The African Union has adopted an anti-ICC uh, 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 position, which was, I believe, with every justification referred to this morning by one of the speakers, as an elitist position, completely ignoring the interest of hundreds of thousands of victims of war crimes uh, who are suffering today uh, on our continent, completely leaving them off, uh, off, uh, off the table. Many cases have in fact been referred to the court, incidentally or interestingly, by African governments. Uh, and this has gone a long way. This process of referring cases of impunity to the court has gone a long way to checkmate uh, impunity in the continent and to put everybody you know, on their toes. Still, whether it is deserved or not, the reality is that the Africa-ICC relationship suffers from misinformation, misperceptions and misunderstandings. Impunity for serious human rights violations is still a common problem and often not enough is being done to prosecute those crimes on a national level. It is against this backdrop that the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability was created in November 2015, bringing together a team of Africa's most respected thinkers on international criminal justice and human rights. The group hopes to be a game changer in the way African states deal with international justice institutions and accountability in general bridging gaps and fostering understanding. You know, that's why we are very ready to listen to you. The professional field of each group member was an important part of the selection criteria used to form the team. The most important contributions of the group is to try to bring different positions together. And for us to be able to bring different positions together, we have to understand the different positions. I think that in our individual capacities, we command enough respect, we have enough integrity as individuals and even more so as a group to be able to influence, to persuade and to move you know, people in different spaces, uh, stakeholders in different spaces, to deliver what we believe is justice for the victims of crime, crimes against humanity, but also for world peace uh, and, and security. Other members of the Africa Group include human rights lawyer Femi Falana, former chief prosecutor of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, Justice Richard Goldston, former chief prosecutor of the ICTR, Hassan Jalo, former legal counsel of the Organization of African Unity, 
Tia Malua. Kenyan lawyer Betty Murungi, an international consultant for human rights and transitional justice. Chief Justice of Tanzania, Mohamed Othman. Algerian human rights expert Fatia Suro. Former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pele. Former President of the Central African Republic, Catherine Samba Panza. And Executive Director of the Open Society Initiative for West Africa, Abdul Tijan Cole. Before getting to grips with the full implications of its mandate, members of the Africa Group met and took part in a symposium on one of the areas where its intervention may be the most needed, Africa's relationship with the International Criminal Court. Hosted by the University of Cape Town in its historic Jan Smuts Hall, the symposium opened with some reflections on this relationship by the current president of the International Criminal Court, Justice Sylvia Fernandez de Gomendi. First of all, we need to recall that the court is a treaty body. So the court can only operate within the parameters of the treaty. And within these parameters, the court at this point in time cannot intervene in any situation uh, that would uh, justify its attention. Because, simply because we have no jurisdiction. Hmm? The, uh, the court uh, can, uh, has a global mandate, but has not yet universal participation. The discussion on the ICC's relationship with Africa was especially opposite. Many participants agreed that the ICC needs to communicate better with its constituencies in Africa. Another controversial issue was the fact that permanent United Nations Security Council members who were not ICC states, parties, could nonetheless affect the court's actions through the referral mechanism. The ICC should essentially keep getting better at doing what it is supposed to do and engage in effective investigations, prosecutions and trials, not only where it is an investigation, but hopefully in a number of the places beyond Africa that are now in preliminary examination as well. And in terms of what, uh, what states can do, I mean, I think they should, the most important thing that states can do is to follow the law. In South Africa, follow your own courts. In Kenya, there are, there are cases in the, in the domestic system seeking accountability for what happened in the 2007 and 8 um, violence, follow those court decisions, allow them to proceed and do what you're supposed to do. I think states can do most by simply ensuring that their obligations under the Rome Statute are uh, implemented. Africa Group, um, so, so called, uh, I think has an important function to raise awareness about the importance of international criminal justice, accountability uh, and redress in Africa. But I think it can also play an additional function which is in fact to explain this link between peace building processes and international criminal justice processes. Nonetheless, important points were made about how crucial other justice mechanisms, both local and regional, are in addressing core international and transnational crimes, as the mandate of the International Criminal Court is to go only after the perpetrators most responsible for serious crimes. Justice de Gomendi spent time on this, voicing her hopes for the future of positive complementarity. Complementarity is extremely important for the, for, the, for the system of the court to work well. What does it mean? First of all, it means that the court is a last resort court, but it, uh, and that it should only intervene when the national systems, uh, when the national systems are, cannot deal with the matter for whatever reasons. And um, so the court is, is, is not and should not be perceived as an institution that is competing for cases with the national system. On the contrary, it is important for the court that it remains a last resort court, that our resources are really concentrated in those situations where really they cannot be addressed by anybody else. Africa has been an important player in the global struggle for the rule of law and fighting impunity. Taking note of this, the Africa Group sought a cross-section of opinion about developments across Africa aimed at addressing systemic human rights abuses. 
One instance of this phenomenon was the trial of Hissan Habre in Senegal's extraordinary African chambers, which had recently struck a blow for the victims of Habre's brutal regime. In line with this development, initiatives such as the Ugandan International Crimes Division highlighted the importance of strengthening domestic capacity to deal with international crimes. Abdul Tijan Cole, director of the Open Society Initiative for West Africa, shared his thoughts on this. We need to strengthen our national institutions. We need to strengthen our national judicial systems. If you don't want the ICC, if you don't like the ICC, there is a simple alternative within the Rome Statute. Strengthen your national judicial system so that your national judicial system can deliver independent, fair, and credible justice. There are efforts towards a more coherent as well as comprehensive African transitional justice mechanism. While that might seem as something over there, the notion of justice as enunciated in Boutros Boutros Ghali's Agenda for Peace is not a notion of a specific form of justice. It's a notion of including justice as a key cog to peace building, not separate from peace building. There is a real risk of different standards of justice being implemented at the domestic, the regional, the continental, and then the international level. That is four levels of, of um, justice, judicial me mechanisms. And I'm thinking specifically about victims. Um, isn't there a real risk of victims um, doing what we, called, uh, what we call forum shopping? The aggregate group should focus on um, uh, promoting justice and accountability in all its form. Uh, I think uh, the ICC is one, but one mechanism that can be used. I think there are multiple other mechanisms, including using regional courts, including local courts, but accountability comes in various forms. And um, I think for us, and um, for my part, quite candidly, accountability is not just for those who bear the greatest responsibility, but accountability should actually go further down to ensure that victims actually, all victims actually seek and get redress. At the heart of any judicial mechanism, be it the ICC or local judicial processes, is the search for accountability, the human rights agenda, and how to ensure that these crucial rights remain the focus of any attempts to pursue criminals is something that finds champions from among the ranks of the Africa group. Indeed, in their backgrounds and beliefs, Navi Pillay, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and Fatia Soror, Director of Soror Associates for Inclusion and Equity, represent this perspective of justice and accountability. I see that our focus of uh, our group is not just on prosecutions and uh, punishment of perpetrators, that is just one aspect. In any event, that happens after the event. We are much more interested in prevention, and that's why human rights comes in. Even the smallest human rights violation, we will look at, because that can build up into uh, conflict. Number one is really making sure that there is more knowledge and understanding about rights and how they are dealt with um, either by institution, uh, government leaders or other actors, right? Uh, because quite often if there are violations of such rights, uh, we tend to focus on one single actor and we tend to think like because I've been working in conflict is to do with the troops or is to do with the rebels and that is wrong. Africa, initially through the Organization of African Unity, then through the African Union, has made a lot of progress in addressing the humanitarian aspect of conflict. But most of this progress resides in the many resolutions that have been made, and not on the ground where they are needed most. <music> Professor Tia Malua, Agja member from Malawi, himself a participant in the drawing up of the humanitarian framework of the African Union, reflected on this issue during the symposium. Africa is not short of ideas. 
when it comes to bringing up new ideas about human rights, whether it is establishing the right to development, the right to environment, and so on, even before the United Nations got to that, here, this was the first time that a regional organization had included in its foundational legal instrument this notion of the right of humanitarian intervention in situations of you know, uh, grave atrocities, et cetera, et cetera, and yet the practice post-2000 has not borne this promise out. And so it points to the point that was made by several speakers yesterday, that it is one thing to have all these commitments uh, on paper, it is one thing to sign up to all these treaties, adopt all these things. If there is no will, political will, to implement what uh, obligations have been uh, uh, adopted uh, in these instruments, then uh, we can talk about progress uh, you know, uh, on the continent. And I think Burundi is a perfect example of the failure of the institution itself to live up to its word and try to resolve a situation in a human rights framework that would be faithful to the very idea that we adopted in Lome in 2000. One tenet of international criminal justice by which the African Union has largely refused to abide is the acceptance that heads of states' immunity for core international crimes has ceased to exist. Interestingly, March 2016 had just seen South Africa the host nation for the AGJA Symposium, handing down a remarkable ruling on this very issue. The South African Supreme Court of Appeal found that the government had breached its obligations by failing to arrest Sudanese President and ICC indictee Omar al-Bashir when he visited the AU summit in Pretoria in June 2015. This sparked off some robust debate at the symposium. I think the Bashir debate and the Malabo Protocol together are going to have two insidious effects. First of all, there's going to be a hardening of the, the position of, I think, continental leaders in relation to the immunities for African elites. There's going to be a push for African elites and their immunities to be recognized. We've already seen that, of course, through the Malabo Protocol. And relatedly, the second consequence is there's going to be a, an African push for an African court as being an African solution to African problems. In a sense, I also think that if you stretch the provisions of the Rome Statute too much beyond what those who ultimately have to carry them out are able to, you actually risk the system. I mean, the fact is that you had a judgment that was given in June, right? It was a judgment about the interpretation of the framework. That particular interpretation did not sit well with those that thought they understood it. They may well take a decision then, a sovereign decision, which they would be entitled to in terms of that framework, to say, well, if this is how you interpret the framework, then we're not going to be a part of that. Immunity shall not bar the jurisdiction of the court. That quite clearly says that the court will have jurisdiction even when the accused person is, is a head of state or someone who otherwise benefits from immunities under international law. It would be foolish, though, to believe that senior government representatives are the only perpetrators of human rights abuses and atrocities on the continent. Today, transnational crimes such as terrorism dominate headlines across the world, with Africa being no exception. No fewer than three countries in West Africa have to deal with the emergence of terror group Boko Haram. In East Africa, fighting al-Shabaab is no longer a Somali issue, but one that the entire region is facing. The Africa group is alive to this, and part of the symposium was dedicated to this challenge, with insights from experts on transnational organized crime. What we have now are sexy terms that are being used, uh, whether by diplomats, whether by criminal justice actors, whether by politicians. And the sexy terms are, uh, in order to address this crime, we need a holistic approach. I think uh, how many times people have heard that. The most recent one was, well, we need a whole of government approach to deal with the problem of terrorism and to deal with the problem of transnational organized crime. Lately, we heard not only do we need a whole of government approach, in the last UN Security Council Resolution 2178 on foreign terrorist fighters, they talk about having a whole of nations approach. 
So that <laughs> is an understanding that somewhere across the borders, uh, there's a lack of cooperation that the countries have had to deal with. The crimes that were committed by uh, Joseph Kony in Uganda and you know, across the borders were also funded from uh, proceeds from um, the sale of elephant tusks. Even in Somalia, those that have worked in Somalia, Al-Shabaab has also benefited from proceeds of, of elephant tusks as well. Um, in other instances, you find that the sale of timber has really um, been used as a, you know, as a resource to generate funds to either uh, you know, buy uh, illegal arms or to either make sure that um, you know, the various crimes that uh, uh, you know, are intended to be perpetrated are successful. The benefit of codifying transnational crimes in international or regional conventions is therefore uh, the fact that you can, on the one hand, solidify certain emerging core international crimes. For instance, uh, the fact that you are not yet uh, in a position to have a definition on terrorism, move on the discussion there, try to get international consensus and then uh, see to what extent you can codify this in a convention that is then being uh, ratified by, by many or all states. Grounds for the work of AGJA are evident, but what do members of the group have to say about their mandate? Our duty as a group is to douse detention, remove areas of suspicion, and let the concerned Afri or aggrieved African governments to appreciate that this is an international court uh, set up by the, by the member states of the United Nations to promote justice, fight impunity in all parts of the world. In other words, we want to enlighten Africans and indeed the entire world to appreciate the fact that this court is not set out or was not established to uh, harass any head of government in any part of the world. We would like immediately to engage in follow-up with the African Union. We would like to visit the AU. Some of our members will go to the AU uh, rather soon after this meeting and we will engage with the different uh, uh, institutions uh, within the, the framework of the African Union uh, using some of the contacts, whether they're governmental or non-governmental, to engage in, in follow-up discussions with the African Union. We would like to see, secondly, an activity in West Africa where one of our members, the president of um, the CAR, Catherine Samba Panza. So we, as we do this, we believe that it's very important wherever we have an activity to have some kind of a practical capacity building event or a lobbying uh, uh, event on uh, international criminal law and the importance of justice and accountability. The purpose of holding uh, these discussions to me have been fulfilled because we've had some very, very good suggestions and directions from you. Uh, it's a big task. I readily agree we should be looking at prevention because that's part of justice. We prevent violations of human rights. That's the way to achieve justice. Uh, but I want to emphasize that we are an independent group. We volunteered our services. We want to focus on Africa because we are all from Africa. We care about our continent and we care about all the people on our continent who are suffering, will suffer if, if justice is uh, denied to them. The group is committed to being a group that is not just about the ICC. I think that's something on which we have unanimity. It's not a group on the ICC as such. The ICC only comes in because that is one mechanism. The time has come, I believe, for the same civil society that supported South Africa joining the ICC uh, to, to become much more active in ensuring that South Africa doesn't leave the ICC. For the same reason that we joined, uh, the, the, we, we shouldn't be leaving. It really is about ensuring that no crimes against humanity go unpunished. It is our responsibility as countries, as governments, as Africans, as humanity as a whole, whether we are located in NGOs, uh, civil society, government, courts, 
any space in, in, in the world to make sure that we put an end to impunity. Different faces and different experiences make up the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability. Their diversity is a reflection of the myriad challenges they will no doubt face. But the key to their success lies in their independence and common commitment to ending impunity on the African continent and around the world.